First of all, you don't know me. <laughs> We're all about that high school drama girl, drama girl, all about them high school queens. We'll take you for a ride in our comic girl, drama girl, cheering for the right team. Drama queens, drama queens, drama queens. smart girl, rough girl, fashion but you're tough girl, you could sit with us girl. Drama queens, drama queens, drama queens, drama, drama queens, drama queens. Hi buddy! Welcome in everybody! <laughs> Hi! <laughs> you got the whole trifecta today. This feels so nice. Welcome home, Rob. Thank you. Welcome yeah. home, Soph. Thank you. Welcome home, Joy. Thanks. It feels good to be home right? with you guys. Aw, this is great. It's been a minute since yeah. it's been all three of us, but I'm happy I about know. this. This is a nice episode, too. And I don't want to get ahead of us, but I'm going to. I was so delighted to see that you directed this so episode. Thank you. Joy. Me too. And I'm going to get ahead of myself again. One of my favorite shots of the season so Do far. Do tell. Oh, whoa. I'm a, yeah, let's talk about it. Yes, let me talk about the specific shot before we even talk about the episode title. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Hold on. We do have to do the episode title. You're right. We, I forgot that this is part of our That's job. Right. We, we do, we the, do the episode title. Like, <laughs> Well, director, director, read it. Hello, everyone. This is season seven, episode one seven. <laughs> That's 17. At the bottom of everything, air date February 15th, 2010. <laughs> Nathan tries to help Haley and Jamie confront Lydia's seemingly hopeless situation while Brooke and Julian navigate their volatile friendship. While Brooke and Julian navigate their volatile relationship in the midst of a hectic movie shoot. Meanwhile, Clay is on a work trip and runs into a familiar face. <laughs> Miranda also tries to prove to Grubbs that she's the right person to produce his album. Directed by yours truly, writer John Norris. I really enjoyed this episode Ooh. so much. I'm like, glad. Me too. Agreed. It was very well written. I think there could have been it no was. one better to direct it than you because of the the sort of central force in Haley's life being the center of the episode. And I don't know why I heard it. It's like I heard in my ear while I was watching one of the early episodes that you and I did with Hill talking about the the kind of revelation of the simplicity of our show that we just let people talk about their feelings and all this yeah. vulnerability and yeah. all this learning to process and in a way the device of everyone having to help Jamie as a kid process it i was like man this mm. you know obviously we didn't get to meet Haley's mom until this adult f- phase the the time jump of the show but it felt like an old episode to me. I loved it. Yeah. Well, you know, we actually did meet Haley's mom early on when the wedding. We, Nathan and Haley go I forgot. meet. You're right. Yeah, the wedding. But it's been so long. I mean, Rob didn't even know that <laughs> Huey Lewis played Haley's dad. So, like, you know, right. we, we had a lot to catch up on with the two of them or with her anyway. But yeah, I agree. There was there was a simplicity that came back in this. Even in the um the antics with Grubbs mm-hmm. and Miranda, like it was, you know, it was gimmicky and fun, but it was still just two people just trying to connect in a, in a unique yeah. and funny way. And I, there's so much of that in this episode, the simplicity that you're talking about. I really, were you great. aiming as a director to, to try to make it feel like the high school years? Or do you think that was just coming through in like reverse osmosis? No, I think I was just trying to feel the emotion of the mm. of the scenes. I mean, directing for me is like is like mm. listening to music. You you feel in your body where the emotions are sitting. Is it is it high, fast paced um, anxiety like the scene with Mitch and uh, not uh, and uh, Jana, Alex <laughs> and Alex and Alex, <laughs> the daddy Alexes, um, is or is it? softer and more gentle and like the opening scene where I'm watching Lydia and all the little movements that you appreciate about somebody as you recognize that they're going to be slowly mm-hmm. leaving your presence. Um, so I don't think it was m- more about trying to identify the, with the, with the first few seasons as much as mm-hmm. that just naturally happened because our directors in the first, first, first few seasons Mm-hmm. I think also did that. They really moved with the musical emotion of mm. of the show. Yeah, I like that a lot. The scenes. 
it also feels like it's a combination of good writing for good actors. Yeah. Because I watched that opening scene and my first note is, uh, you know, I like the way we're watching Lydia's story mm. unfold. It feels very grounded and real. So I think you have good writing, but then you have people making smart, subtle, honest yeah. choices. And that kind of set the tone for everything. Because that, that story is the through line to the yeah. episode. Letting it be. Just let it Let, let it people breathe. take a look. No, mm-hmm. Nothing was forced. Even a glance yeah. to the side or just watching somebody sit, let, leave the camera on the actor and trust them to give you what you need. You don't have to mm-hmm. do a lot of stuff with the camera. There's not a lot of fancy tricks that need to be done. Just trust. Yeah. And you know what? It's a really good point because when you give great actors, you know, like Bess and, and all of you surrounding her and all these scenes, really good material, it's also not overwritten. It wasn't one of those scripts where you knew yeah. you were going to lose two scenes to the cutting room floor just to make time. You actually had time to watch a line be delivered and then watch someone think about what they just said. We had some air to breathe. And I think that was really important for the yeah. subject matter because if it had been if it had been sped up for the amount of lines in the episode, there was so much nuance we would have missed. Mm. Have you ever heard that story about an old black and white movie? It's like one of the classics. And at the final shot is, is, is the woman watching like a boat go off into the distance and, you know, it's on her. And I guess the story goes that she you went to the director and, and said, you know, what, what should I be thinking about? You know, what, while I watch that. And he said, uh, doing your laundry when you get home. She was like, <laughs> what? And he said, don't you don't have to do anything. The mm. audience is going to project all of their own yeah. stuff that they've been feeling for the last 89 minutes onto that moment. And I love that, right? Because it's the truth. And like, it's same thing with this one. Like everyone has a story that's, uh, that's similar to mm-hmm. what Lydia and the, and the Scots are going through, right? So everyone has their own baggage that they're going to bring to yeah. that scene. So when you have a good actor kind of just sit back and do a little with it, it's not a problem because the audience mm. is going to meet them halfway yeah. or more than halfway with their own stuff to fill in all yeah. the blanks. That's a really fun part of acting when you just get to hold space. You know, there's times when you have to drive yeah. a scene and you really have to dive in. But man, to be able to just sit back and hold space for the audience, that's the kind of storytelling that's like, it feels like you're really in service. You're not there for an ego boost. You're there to just open it up and let people, let, let the audience do what they need to. Yeah. I love it. That's really cool. I had this, uh, an early mentor of mine say, um, it should be a privilege mm. for the audience to know what you're thinking. Mm, that's interesting. And then we'd be, occasionally, we'd be occasionally doing a scene and he'd be like, Robbie, Les, this is, this is your lean in moment. And I was like, what's, and he goes, this is when we get the audience to lean forward in their chairs. Mm. I was like, oh. So it was, it was kind of the it's beginning so of cool. that like. I'm going to write that down. It should be a privilege for the to audience you. to know what you're thinking. I love that. That's great. Yeah. Shout out Tim hey. Busfield. What up, Tim? <laughs> you know what? It makes me think of a scene that you, um, a little further into the episode, I know we're going to probably bounce around today because we're talking about so much emotional stuff. There's that great scene where Quinn takes Clay to see the gallery space. And I wrote yes. down that, you guys did something really special because we've all been in that position where something horrible is happening and you got to just do what you got to do. You know, she's got this thing happening at home as all the James girls do, but she's trying to keep it positive and Clay's going out of town and Quinn's got the space and you stop her and you call yourself the poster boy for suffering alone. And Mm. Chantel made such a great choice or maybe it was just what was happening between the two of you like sometimes it takes you over and sometimes you're really trying to do the right thing for the roller coaster of the episodes I don't know what she was thinking but I loved watching you because I saw you offer an observation of yourself crack her open because she knew she was being seen and it is so hard to act on the verge of crying not to just cry and she mm. is trying to hold those tears in and keep it upbeat. And her, she's smiling, but her voice is cracking and her eyes are tearing. And you're just standing there telling her you're going to be home as quickly as you can. And neither of you is really saying the thing, but you're saying so much. And I was like, oh, my God, this is one of my favorite scenes in the episode. Like, you guys were beautiful. so beautiful together. She was so good in that scene. The takeaway, the note I had from that was, uh, yeah. these two are a really good team. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. Okay. I wrote, 
she's on the edge the whole time and it makes me want to sob. <laughs> That's my no. Is that like <laughs> I'm watching these people yes. do this beautiful job, like trying not to cry alone in my living room. You're right. That's the smart part about Ugh. that's the interactive storytelling of an actor holding it back because then it gives you the chance. It's like, you know, when you grow up in a family where there's one person with all the emotion and nobody else has yes. space for their own emotions. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I wonder what you're talking about. Ben. <laughs> so yeah. that's what it's like to be able to be an actor and hold it back so that you're not taking over the emotional space. Let the audience mm. have the emotion that they need to have. That's exactly what you're talking about, I think. Do you remember directing the scene? I do. because, And what I remember is that you mm-hmm. guys made it so easy because exactly that. I didn't have to, there wasn't a lot to to do. There, It was just let them mm-hmm. feel what they're feeling. I think I, I just trust audiences a lot, probably a lot more than I should. I don't know. But I, I give, I think I give people a lot of credit for being smart. And so I... I don't know. It seemed like it was going to work, but it did. Yeah, I don't think that's a fault. I think that's a good thing because the result is good TV. Yeah. yeah. Before I forget, let me just tell you what my oh, favorite yeah, tell show me. was because I'm going to jump way ahead. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Owen and Millie <gasps> storyline, first of all, was wild and great, yeah. especially great because I, in the in the recovery meeting, I, when, when she sees Owen, I thought, oh, no way. This is an interesting way to bring Joe back. And then about five minutes later in my notes, I'm like, wait a second. Isn't he the one she yes. slept with? And then, and then when she has him come pick her up <gasps> oh, at the apartment. Gosh. First mm-hmm. of all, when she walks in and she's really petty and jealous to nope. Miss Lauren and uh, and Mouth, I was like, "Come on!" Then she has Owen pick her up at the place. Mm-hmm. Double come on! <laughs> but when they're bowling, the shot is this. Sorry, this is the this is the scenic route to getting to my point. They uh, they're bowling. It's the end of the scene. Yes. And they both sit down to take their shoes off. And, and lean, they lean forward. forward. Yes, I wrote it down too. It's just a shot at knee level, but both heads have dipped into mm-hmm. it. And they're just talking. And I thought, <laughs> oh, that is such a cool, mm-hmm. unique shot. I, oh, I love that. Do you remember doing you. that? That's not one of the ones that was like really sticking in my mind. I just remembered it. I mean, no, I mean, I like that shot too. I, I want, I was always looking for ways to have people not be talking heads. Like sometimes it's important to just, as we say, leave the camera alone and let people do what they're doing. But I wanted to create a sense of intimacy. So I'm I'm sure that was one of those things that I was just watching them do their action. And, you know, when you disc- you watch an actor create a moment, you're like, oh, that's exciting. Stay there for a second. Mm-hmm. Let me figure out how I can, I love the feeling I'm getting. I want to get closer. So I think yeah. they just did that in rehearsal and it naturally was great. Let's do well, it. And it was so, what I loved about it too, is that it felt spontaneous, which is such a nice feeling to get when you know you've shot a scene 86 times yeah. in like wide shots and close-ups and whatever. And I loved that they both leaned in and we didn't watch them taking off their bowling shoes to put their shoes on, but we knew exactly what they were yeah. doing. Yeah. You know? Great. So I cool. liked this storyline. I like the two of them. I relate to the sense of, <laughs> yes, they they had this moment together. I don't know whether we landed on it was a mistake or it was just what it was. I, I mean, we had a lot of issues around the way those episodes were written around Millie and her virginity and all that. But they experienced something together that created a ripple effect in their lives. And still coming back together and talking through things, being friends Mm -hmm. instead of just avoiding each other, like understanding that there's something in the shared experience that they need each other and that's okay. It doesn't, everything doesn't have to be perfectly clean cut and following all the rules of how you should be interacting with people. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I just really, Mm -hmm. I really like their dynamic a lot. And I didn't it's know how so much weird. I missed Owen until I saw him just as a yes. viewer. I was like, oh, yeah, Owen, <laughs> I miss him. Well, it's also really refreshing when, to your point, we've sort of seen this <sighs> pseudo stereotypical thing happen and we go, ick. And then this unexpected thing happens episodes later. And and Owen knowing where Millie is because he was there once. Yeah. And being a good friend and being uh, 
you know, protective and encouraging in a way it, it's almost like a palate cleanser for all the stuff we hated months ago. Mm, yeah. And, and it reminds you of how great actually both of these people are. Yeah. And, and I appreciate when we don't act, look, life is not black and white, right? Like everything yeah. is shades of gray. You can be a good person and still have made a mess. You can be an incredible uh, spouse, partner, daughter, son, whatever, and and still have hurt someone you care about and been devastatingly hurt by people you care about. I appreciated in this that we let people make a mess and clean it up. Yeah, we get to see the longevity of that. Yeah, it's it's human. And I think maybe it feels even more refreshing you know, because we we now live in an, a sort of experiential era that we didn't when we were filming this, where everything is so like sharp and judgmental, and the internet is full of bots, and like everything's mm. just vicious everywhere. Yeah, there's no room for longevity. There's no room for people to be people. And I love, I don't know. I was so relieved to see that long arc of this relationship and the healing yeah. that they're doing and the way that they only really can see each other right now yeah. and like support each other. And I just thought it was really beautiful. You know what else? Uh, I don't think I had seen almost any of, certainly not on the CW at the time, was AA or any kind yeah. of like a group therapy, group accountability, like like a... The, the normalizing of go mm-hmm. going to a meeting, like just show yes. up at a Tuesday afternoon meeting. And if somebody there is makes you uncomfortable, the, the fact that he offered, like we can schedule it so we go on different days, just the normalizing of that in conversation that it's, it's totally okay and it's good and it's helpful. Mm-hmm. I, I realized that just watching it back, I was like, I don't think I'd seen almost any of that on TV. Mm-mm. So it was kind of cool. It was cool. Yeah, for as much as I disliked Millie's drug storyline, I, I I found this refreshing. Yeah. yeah. It was it was the right amount of like raw and messy, but honest. Mm-hmm. And the way that they wrote Owen into it and he sort of shepherding yeah. her mm-hmm. being the more experienced with some time, you know, recovery time was great. Yeah. You know, and I think there's a line where she says something like Thanks. I don't. I don't think you know how much that means yeah. to me. He's like, I do. <laughs> exactly. I was like, been there. Great. You said so much there with yes. two words. Yeah. Okay. Simple. Cut it down. Just cut it down. Because there's so much power in it. And you know what's crazy? Just hearing you say that, Joy. Like, I just had this whoa because obviously we all talk a lot about, you know, growth and journeys because our characters went through them. We've all been on this ride together for, you know, 10 to 20 years. And like seeing you talk about how that just wasn't a thing then and your book is behind you. It's like I I sort of had this out of body experience being like, oh, my God, could you imagine if then when you felt as isolated as you did? And I hope it's okay that I'm bringing this up. But like you you were so stuck in your high demand group. We all were also in a. It, like an almost toxically masculine environment yeah. where no matter what was happening to anyone, we were never supposed to bring it up and never supposed to talk about it and never supposed to rock the boat. And you were supposed to come to work and like do your thing. And, you know, I think so much about how this was the season after like Hillary left when she and I finally got to start talking about some of the things that we were putting the pieces together as we talked about earlier in the show. Like, the things Mark was doing, yeah. the things our boss was doing and saying behind our backs that yeah. we couldn't really talk about until she was gone. And it's like, can you imagine if instead of coming to work and being like, hey, are you good? And then waiting mm. and being like, yeah, I'm good. Are you good? And everyone was kind of like, yeah. Like if therapy, if, if, if AA, if any of this any stuff of had been less taboo, like, can you imagine how how much quicker we would have arrived to this oh my place. God. It would have changed. That would have changed my life. And I'll tell you, yeah. you know, we, I had, there was addiction in my family and it's in the lineage, you know, but that stuff gets mm-hmm. passed down, whether it's your immediate family or your, or your um, right, right before the grandparents. And mm-hmm. my, I remember my mom taking me to Al-Anon, which is for family members of addicts. And I remember her yeah. taking me when I was like 16 to, and dropped me off 
you know, thinking this is going to be good for her. It, it's helpful. Like she, it was, she was all, it was best of intentions. But at 16, it was like this dark, small room. I think there was like six other people. I was so uncomfortable. I didn't, I wasn't in touch with my feelings anyway at that age. Mm-hmm. And it just felt so awful. And it hadn't been normalized because the shows that I was watching at that age, those networks weren't mm-hmm. talking about things like that on a, on a regular basis. That just was not normal. But man, if that had become a normal part of my life at 16, right? 17, when I came to Wilmington, if I had just looked for some Al-Anon meetings to just jump into and maintain this sense of um, accountability for, and, and, and anonymity, but also being able to recognize there were plenty of other people in the room who feel just like me because you feel so much less isolated yeah. when you're when yeah, you're to know you weren't alone exactly you're just in a room full of strangers i don't need to know everything about their mm-hmm. life we don't need to be best friends but to hear two minutes of somebody's story about how they're struggling mm-hmm. and how they're coping how they're feeling today if they're mm-hmm. feeling great if they're feeling terrible it's like oh my god i am a part of the humanity i'm part of the human experience it's it absolutely would have been life changing. You're right. I wish I had. Yeah, and I, and I do too. I mean, I think about like, you know, I tried to start doing therapy. I don't know halfway through our third season, and with our hours, I could never go. Like, there aren't therapists' right. office that can work around a 17 hour, you know, a day schedule. Yeah, and I didn't know about Al Anon. I didn't. I didn't know about any of those things then. Yeah. And I don't know. I guess it's a really, it's like it's kind of a long way around to get back to the point, but. It's profound for us to watch now. And like, we're 40. <laughs> Imagine what it would have been like then. I don't know. I, I I almost wonder, like, if anyone is listening, I wonder if any of the fans of our show had an aha moment watching this mm. episode, like seeing a meeting and going, I think I need that. Mm. You know, the way we have a union rep come to set like once yeah. a season. Yeah. It would be great if there was just an Al Anon rep yes. yeah. who popped by and was like, hey. There's so much doing? addiction mm-hmm. in Hollywood and in our, like, it's rampant all around. To have somebody specifically mm-hmm. from Al-Anon would have been great. <gasps> and and for as rampant as addiction is, so is recovery. Mm. Amen. I love yes. that, Rob. And, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a, there's a large school of thought that says, you know, the the opposite of addiction isn't isn't abstinence or sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. <laughs> yeah. You know, and there's this science experiment that was done. And uh, this guy, he took a hundred rat, uh, like rat, or no, he took rats individually, right? And he had two, um, like water things where like like zippers, and one of them had morphine in it. Mm. And individually, like I think ninety nine percent of the rats ended up overdosing. And wow. then he put them. He he t- decided to switch it up, and he said, "I wonder if I put them all in like a communal, like a community sort of structure, so they're all together and still provide." the same options and the overdose dropped to like zero or one percent whoa and so it was just kind of it was the beginning of this conversation of you know the the opposite of addiction is community and like so what you were talking about joy it's like it's about connection because that's the thing it's so isolated Mm -hmm. you know and as soon as you hear your story coming out of someone else's mouth it allows you to sort of take that weight off your chest of like, oh, I'm, I'm not, not alone. uniquely broken. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This struggle is actually common. Like I have teammates, yes. mm-hmm. you know, and that's when recovery becomes a team yeah. sport, you know, as opposed to, I think a lot of people go into it thinking like, I got, I got to figure yeah. out how to do this on my own. This is an in-house job, which is a losing problem. Yeah. And it's harder for people to use it and weaponize your, your issues against you. If you re- realize that you're just one of many. That it's, there's Mm -hmm. a normalcy to it that we're all just trying to figure out. Yeah. You know? Also, I just, I love the irony of of your mom dropping you off. Granted, I don't know anything about your family, but the irony of like a mom dropping her 16 year old off at an Al-Anon meeting, having no idea she's planting the seeds (laughs) to a lot of her own stuff coming to light. Yeah, yeah, for sure. (laughs) It's like, mom, this is going to work, but not in the way you think. (laughs) Yeah. You're like, are you ready to talk about family structure Mm -hmm. and trauma? Because if not. Don't open this door. I wanted to bring up the uh, the first moment we see with you, excuse me, with Brulian. With, uh, a Brulian moment. You and Austin. Yes, on set. It was a really, speaking of good teammates, you two are so 
it just infinitely likable mm. and uh, so great together. But I loved this moment, right? Because I love a vulnerable guy. Give me all that all day. Yes. Right? And I love when he's like, hey, can I ask you a question I can like only ask you? And I'm like, what is this going to be about? And he just goes, am I doing okay? Oh. <laughs> and man, that hit me in the heart. Oh. I was like, I believe that. I love that. And that was just such good partnering. And then the way that Brooke responds to him is just so sweet and yeah. loving. But that was such a good peek behind the curtain of like where you guys were still at mm -hmm. that I just thought was so great. Yeah, it was it was really fun to play this this kind of time. Obviously, it's you know, there's there's sort of sadness to disrupted relationship. And I, I thought a lot about watching, you know, Brooke and Mouth and Haley on the couch at Trick. Because um, she's like, I just don't know. You know, maybe we just don't work. We've all been there, right? Where you're like, God, I really love this person. And like, I just don't know if it works. And I, <laughs> I made a note um, in my notes where I was like, I love that Haley, especially our friend, you know, who's on camera, been married since she was 16, is like, go get him, make it work. And I'm like, that works for Naley. But like for most of us in the real world, like it doesn't work more often than it does. And yet what what sort of hit me as being so sweet and I and I laughed. I was like, I really love that everyone's encouraging Brooke to like, you know, put the walls down and be vulnerable and lean in. What I see watching this is like the fun that Austin and I got to have together. And, and, you know, now all these years later, like the friendship we've had since we were 23 years old. And I like watching these two trying to figure it out because I see, I see versions of who I was and who he was and who all of us were in that push and pull. And I kind of, you know, I, oh, this is what I wrote in my notes. I was like, of course, we give the rom-com answer of like, no matter what, figure it out, which like, LOL, maybe rom-coms are the reason everyone's in therapy. <laughs> but I also, I just love that we got to watch um, a struggle that wasn't related to some crazy dramatic event or an affair or a car accident or whatever, that it was really two people trying to figure out if they could be emotionally compatible mm. you know could they feel safe together could they learn to communicate better could they build a life together yeah. and I like that it wasn't an easy answer yeah it, it seems like for Brooke there's been so much volatility in relationships and mm -hmm. there was with Julian because of this his savior complex issues and the the situation <laughs> with Alex um, but I really, really like seeing Brooke, um, being willing to make space for somebody else's flaws. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. she had, you know, she's been, that's the, the whole thing. Choose me, pick me right for her that she does deserve that. But also, as you say, like, there's a lot of gray in life. There's a lot of just humanity and messiness that we try and sort through and, mm -hmm. It's really cool. I'm I'm still irritated with Julian. I don't know why he keeps making <laughs> bad Alex decisions. Like, let me walk totally. you to your room. Are you a effing yeah. idiot? I just can't wrap my brain around it. But that's his that's his deal. Like, okay, okay, man, you're working through your stuff. Um, yeah. But there's a softness. There's like a real. This is a totally different side of Brooke that we're seeing in a consistent way. This has been like mm -hmm. four four episodes now, maybe five, yeah. that you're really just softer. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, I like it. And I like, I, I saw kind of a parallel, obviously different, uh, you know, relationship stage and, and different issues. But in the same way that I really loved what Clay and Quinn weren't saying in the gallery, I really loved what Brooke and Julian weren't saying about the sweater. Johnny Norris did such mm -hmm. a good job writing these scenes for us that we got to talk uh, with so much subtext and, you know, Brooke's telling him he's got to dress a little warmer on set and, you know, oh, it's your sweater anyway. Mm. And, and these things, but she's saying, 
I know you're tired and it's cold in here and I'm worried about you and I love you. Mm -hmm. And he's telling her that, you know, she can always sit in his chair. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's saying like, you're you're in the chair, mm-hmm. like you're my person and they can't say it. And I, that's I don't good know. writing. That's when, you know, the writer trusts the right? actors. They're writing they're, They just write the words and they know that, you know, the subtext yeah. and they trust you to do it. Cause if the scene was just yeah. about a chair and a sweater, everyone would be bored. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but hold on. Speaking of the wardrobe, first of all, uh, shout out to the actual real life one tree Hill wardrobe. Yes. Oh, the, yeah. The big warehouse. <laughs> Our warehouse. <laughs> Listeners, that was our actual wardrobe oh, warehouse. Fun. What I loved about that first, my first thought was like, oh my gosh, that was our actual wardrobe uh, warehouse. Yeah. And then my second thought was, it's hilarious to me that a low budget indie with presumably about two actors in it had a warehouse of wardrobe <laughs> that big. Mm-hmm. Because just so you know, on, a, on an indie that size, you would have maybe one rack of wardrobe for like- yeah. All of yeah, your cast. yeah. You'd have you'd have half a trailer full of clothes, <laughs> and we had yes. we had seven seasons worth, plus like all the Dawson's Creek leftovers, totally. plus any other show that had ever shot at Screen Gems in a warehouse. Movie magic. It's got to look big and uh, bold. No, it honestly, so it funny. was just cheaper than creating a a set full sure. of uh, like a like a half yeah. a trailer, like a realistic movie set that would have looked so puny too. I think the audience would have been like, wait, why do they have like six clothes on a hanger? Yeah. Hanging rack. And what you were saying, Soph, about the going for it, the one thing I like, you know, the show does a lot, that thing where it's like on the act out of one scene, someone will be saying a line that then feeds into the act in of another yes. scene. We sort of had a similar thing with the through line of people encouraging each other to go for mm. it. And what I really liked about that was I, I'm a big believer in like, I'll take regret over, or excuse me, I'll take failure over regret any day, like a hundred, a 10 out of 10 times, you know? And so I liked that. It was just kind of this, like, who cares? Like, go for it. Shoot your shot mentality. Um, so I, I really appreciated that. I was surprised by some of the shots taken though. Say more. <laughs> Okay. First of all, I'm watching every Miss Lauren and mouth scene for the past three episodes. And I've been saying this in the podcast right? going, did anyone feel like they were about to kiss? The whole time. Yeah. And then this episode, I'm doing the same thing. I'm like, gang, what are, what we, are doing? we doing? I was really yeah. confused. First of all, does she have no right. friends? She's just like become a best friend of Mouth. But how and- does he not know that she's not talking to skills? How is right? that a qu- he, First of all, she, he asks her to what? Pick up lunch? Okay, so she brings over lunch. So they're going to hang out. And she's like, oh, what are you doing? Playing video games. Okay, but so what was their plan? I don't know why. I, I wish I remembered how we tried to make sense out of this because it, did, it didn't make sense to me even today. Well, and it was so jarring that it took me out of it. And I was like, wait, was Antoine making a movie? Like, where was Antoine? We sent him to L.A. to, like, make, you know, the sports coordinating thing yeah. happen. But, like, really, where was he? And obviously, Allison Munn is the greatest human alive. So, like, duh, we wanted to never let her leave mm-hmm. set. Yeah. But I, I was like, how are we not? Why isn't she hanging out with, like, Brooke and Haley also? Yeah, like, like where her are other friends? friends? It's just weird because it's so fun to have her. But they do have great chemistry Mm. and because we only see them together over the span of all these episodes it gets to a point where as an audience member you're like well are you trying to tell me they have more than friend chemistry because at this point it feels like you are yeah what's going on here and it does feel confusing well and we've never seen either of them separately or together have one of those moments of like oh is this maybe more than just buds so that's why it was so as an audience member, I'm watching it going, this mm-hmm. is strange. There's something not being addressed. I don't quite get it. So that's why it was odd for me when fast forward to the end of the episode, Mouth's speech isn't yeah. to Millie. It's to Miss Lauren at her door. Yeah. I just thought like, where, why have I not seen him like have, you know, a lingering smile at her or yes. any sort of no. like. Any sort of runway to get we to this moment. We uh, needed the Anything. the George and Elaine without Jerry episode. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> no. George and Elaine go out without Jerry. Jerry's like, he can't go to the movie, whatever. He's stuck and they're both out. Like, this is so awkward. We don't hang out with each other without Jerry. What do we do? But then, you know, yeah. they make friends by the end of the episode, of course. But 
Well, not of course, but anyway, that's what we needed. We needed this like moment of the two of them kind of being thrust into yeah. a situation together where they're like, oh, actually we we do have a lot in common in spite of the fact that you're, we, we never really hung out outside of skills. Like, I kind of like you, let's hang out more. Exactly. It would have been so great if at any point they'd been like, I'm really glad I have you to talk to, but is it weird that I'm talking yes. to you about all this stuff since we've never really hung out before mm. and the other person could have been like, no, it's honestly such a relief to me. Like I, you know, yeah. something to something. acknowledge that it was weird, so weird would have, I think, brought the the whole audience along better. I wonder if fans felt that too. Are, like, are we just feeling yeah. it because we are watching the episodes so quickly and back then it was all really stretched out? That might be part of it. I just wonder if the fans felt that way too. If they, by the end of the episode, they were like, uh, what? <laughs> okay, so that's our second question. So first one, obviously only if you feel comfortable sharing with us and we would never reveal personal details anyway. But if if anyone was like, whoa, when they saw a meeting and, it, and they remember it being impactful back then, we'd love to know. Mm-hmm. And question number two, were you all completely confused by Mouth and Miss Lauren also? Or are we nuts? The people, the people want to know. The girlies <laughs> and the boy want to know. Yeah, because also, am I, am I not remembering correctly that there's like mouth has a moment of saying it's complicated with Millie. Like he he's confiding to someone, right? Because we see the opposite yes. side of it with Millie and Owen, where he's like, yeah, no, mouth has a moment of saying something to the effect of, you know, like we're off or like we're just misfire mm-hmm. something, right? And then Millie has the same moment, so it was just. It felt out of left field. Like the, I feel like, I feel like the audience member understood it more than the character did. And yeah, it's interesting to me because I remember feeling this kind of like, ah, this is when you were going to get the landscaper joy. Rob and I were talking about, there's that great scene where you come in and sit with, with Brooke and Mouth on the couch. Mm. And it's like, tell me the, tell me the, you know, spill the tea. Let's talk all the things. And it made me go, wait a second. Why haven't we seen mouth talking to Brooke about Millie or Brooke and Millie hanging out at all. Like, I don't know. It's weird to me that, that people aren't leaning on each other a little more, but I guess that's what happens when you have so many actors on a show. And 22 episodes. Yeah. I think that's probably part of the casualty of so many actors, so many storylines and 22 episodes and it wasn't, a, as I understand it, a terribly happy writer's room. And so I think there was probably mm. just a lot. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so I would imagine there's just some things that there wasn't a, a real symbiosis happening. Not a lot of, uh, there wasn't really a groove for people to get into with some of these storylines. and So they couldn't plan ahead too far, I think. And then you never know if an actor is going to be available or not. And so then you have to pivot if they're not. Um, I think there was just a lot on the fly. And then that those are the kinds of things that happen. Suddenly they've got to speed up a storyline that makes no sense that they've laid no groundwork for. And we've seen this right. a lot before. I also feel like there might be some truth to us simply not wanting to lose Allison. A- yeah. oh, 100%. Yes. She's so great. Cause this story does just kind of feel weird. It sort of just feels a bit like not a placeholder, but like, all right, what can we do? You well, know what I mean? Like it doesn't feel field. very, yes. 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 And she's so darn good in it. Mm -hmm. It makes sense why you'd want to keep her because you don't want to lose her. But it's sort of like, yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, it feels like they there was a question mark over everyone's (laughs) schedules and they just sort of went, let's just find something for Allison to make sure that we don't lose her Mm. to a different show. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense because she was super in demand, too. I mean, that girl books pilots like I book plane tickets. I mean, on and on and on. (laughs) Nice. Bess Armstrong. Yes, can we talk about Bess Armstrong? Is the real deal, man. For those who don't know, Bess Armstrong played Lydia and just, she's so good. Mm -hmm. She's so, so good. And Joy, you have so many great scenes with her. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, And the way that you shot it and it was written, I just loved it. You know, because we are, we're a soap. You know, like we tend to like, 
swing for the fences and high highs and low lows. And this just felt like a very grounded, honest portrayal of a family, like grieving and adapting in real time. Yeah. And she's just so, was it tough doing, you had a great scene where it was just the two of you on the Mm. couch. By the way, Joy, you also had a scene where you're on the couch with your shoes (gasps) on and you're sitting on your feet. (laughs) Explain yourself. (laughs) Oh, and before we get into like the really important stuff, did you also notice in the scene with Alex and Alex after the one night stand, clearly, listeners, go back and watch this. Every pillow on that bed is either a throw pillow yes. or a couch pillow. Set deck clearly had no normal pillows and they were like, no one's going to be looking at that. Go back and look at every pillow on the bed is the ugliest hotel room couch pillow you've ever seen. Yeah, there's not like the two rear pillows that are for sleeping. It's just the Correct. display pillows. I can't believe I missed that. I'm such a detail oriented person. That's really funny. I must have, it's I was so, so tied up with getting that shot in particular. I remember we were, we were uh, running out of time and it, there were a lot of things I was like, I really wanted to be a time efficient director because I wanted them to keep bringing me back. So there were scenes I was like, what can we do in one or two shots? And that was one of the scenes yeah. that it was like, I think it was a three shot scene, but the close ups on the two of them, we probably did in two takes and the rest of it was on one camera. And the, yeah, there was a there was a lot of maneuvering around for that. So I'm sure I didn't notice the pillows, but dang it, I wish I had pillows. I also just love that as someone who lived in New York for as long as you did, like this is how you realize we walk to set in like Uggs or slippers and then you put on your wardrobe heels on set because no, not none of us would ever wear our outside shoes on the furniture into the house, let alone onto the furniture no. ever. Never. Appalling. <laughs> so gross. No, but remember we had that fit. Maybe you weren't here. So if there was a fan who wrote in a question was asking us, I noticed that you guys put your shoes on, you wear your shoes on the couch or you walk on the rug or whatever with your shoes. And I think the, it was that we don't have a lot of time. Like you, you can't just be taking your shoes on and off for every moment well, of every scene. Plus people are creepy. And, and because during filming, it, it's a huge height differential. Oh yeah. And we were like one of the only shows in history, in the history of Hollywood with tall boys. <laughs> you had to wear high heels to act opposite James. Yeah. I had to wear high heels to act opposite Austin. Yeah. They weren't going to like build us step blocks to get into close-ups where they could see us over the boys' shoulders. So we were stilettos every day yeah. it was ridiculous i think i imagined that those sets were like I, I i've never had a one of those houses that you walk into and everything's always in its place all the time i have friends who yeah. every time i go to their house i'm like what what do you how do you do this because i'm definitely messy um so i think i imagine nathan and Haley's house being one of those super pristine homes that like there's just fairies that come and clean up after you if you put your shoes on the couch. Yeah, like, called set deck. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this, I didn't know what it was until, you know, later in life, obviously, because we both got our, our diagnoses later in life. But in the world of learning about being neurodivergent and and when it's like, oh, yeah, do you have little piles everywhere? And I was like, oh, no, it's, we do. <laughs> and you're like, no, but my little piles are my organizing system. And now, like, my partner affectionately will be like, are you stressed, little squirrel? Look at all your little piles of acorns around the house. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Just saving mm-hmm. up for winter. But you know where just, everything just is in every but pile. we know where everything yes. is. Yes. And, and I didn't know how weird that was to people whose brains aren't wired like ours. Yeah. Until people were like, isn't this anxiety inducing? And I was like, that is like spatial Xanax for me. What do you mean? <laughs> this is for anxiety by anxiety. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> I was like, this is actually called a coping mechanism. <laughs> yes. High functioning anxiety mm-hmm. has many appearances. It certainly mm-hmm. does. Well, mm-hmm. Bess Armstrong was uh I was she was so lovely and open mm-hmm. and made directing her really easy. Um she's such a mom. She's such an encourager and really mm-hmm. you know, she had ideas but she <laughs> It's interesting as an older woman to be directed, like if I had a 23-year-old directing me right now, um, I I hope that I would treat her the way Bess treated me. Like she Mm. really, it's it's interesting to listen to the leadership of someone who's younger than you and really 
trust that they know what they're doing. And especially as an actor, you know, you want to put your best foot forward. You want to be represented in the best way and to trust that somebody knows what they're doing and they're not going to make you look like a fool. Um, She really (laughs) trusted me and it it meant so much to me. Um, We had a great chemistry. We had an ease in our, in our way with each other in the scenes. And um, yeah, it was easy. We just sort of dropped in and said the lines and I don't think we did too many takes. It was just like, just mm-hmm. say what's on the page. It's what you were talking about at the beginning of the episode, Rob. Like just, it's great writing. You let, let good actors do what they do. Yeah, you guys brought it. Yeah. And that, that scene was was very, very touching and just honest. I loved that. Uh, the scene with Jamie, her and Jamie was also very sweet. And I was sitting there noting like, gosh, this is a great scene. And then it ends in a funny Which way one? though. It takes a hard, it's, it's, it's Lydia and Jamie in his room, I think. Mm-hmm. And they're looking at pictures. I think there's an actual picture of you from childhood. Yeah. I believe I think it's an actual real life joy picture. And then, and then, yeah, it takes a real hard left when she's like, P.S. I'm going to be dead by Christmas. <laughs> I shouldn't say it that way. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but she basically yeah. was like, I love celebrating Christmas with you. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be here this year. The look on his face. The look on his face. I let out an audible oof. Yeah. And I heard myself and then made myself laugh. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, this, this really, yeah. she's not, she's not wearing any gloves. She's, she's just going to say the thing. Yeah, really. It's so, and the look on his face, he was like so confused. And then this is actually kind of amazing that a kid this young was capable mm-hmm. of making that transition because he was looking confused and then it hit him and he realized like, whoa, you're saying you're going to be dead, but he didn't overact. Yes. I mean, that's no. kind of hard for a no. kid to make that big weighty transition and not overact. He did, he did great. Yeah, he really just let it happen. And you know what I loved in a way is that the heaviness of that scene that we all went, whoa, it gave such an honest motivation to your scene with her. And I loved that she said you're angry. She said either like you're angry or you're mad. And you were like, I'm not, I'm upset. Mm. And it and it let you guys have a conversation that sadly we know is so universal for so many people who experience illness in their family and you were like wanting to fix it and wanting a second opinion and wanting the thing and wanting nathan's doctors to look and she she got to be like you're not listening to me Mm. i want to enjoy the time i have left i know what it is and so hard and i felt so much for both of you because i know that i would do exactly what Haley was doing Mm. And that if I were in Lydia's position, I would say exactly what Lydia was saying yeah. to Haley. Yeah. And it was, I just thought like, wow, I bet so many people feel really seen by this. The scene with her and James too, I really loved. Oh. That broke my heart. When he thanked her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so simple. It was exactly yeah. so simple, right? Like just let the words do the, do the talking. It was so good. But but yeah. going back, the thing with Jamie, that I, the reason why I bumped on it is because so often people get diagnosed or, or not even diagnosed. They get um, given sort of, you have this many months to live. Mm. Like everyone in their family has a story of like the grandma who was told she had six months to live and she lived for 15 years. Yeah. So I just felt yeah. like it was a little premature to tell the mm. nine-year-old I'm for sure going to be dead as disco by Christmas. <laughs> When it's like, okay, I know your doctor said that, but like, there's a shot. There's a shot. There's a world in which you're yeah. not. You know what I mean? Like, can we just can we give it a second before we tell the yeah, child? No. We've yes. only got two more episodes with me, honey. So please get yourself ready. There it is. There it is. <laughs> it's like Rob. I wish you'd been there to be like. He's not even in double digits. I know. Come on, kitty gloves it, oh. Bess. Just a little. Oh, that is. Funny. The other look on Jackson's face, too, when he came in and said, I don't want grandma to die. Oh. Also, really good, really good performance. So mm-hmm. simple. Yeah, I was impressed with him in this yeah. episode. He was really great. And I and you know what I loved, too? <sighs> they really gave everybody a lot. A lot of these moments I'm realizing where they got to say a lot mm. in not so many words. And you saw that in a lot of Jackson's performances, which obviously are a big deal for a kid his age at the time to be able to pull off. And and in the same way that I felt like Nathan was so 
stoic in the best way with Lydia. You see him do it with Jamie. It's like they really gave James such simple things to say. And James showed up in exactly that incredibly supportive. Yeah. This is not my moment to lead. It's my moment to hold hold you up from behind mm. kind of energy. And even when he finds Jackson cleaning out his toys, it was such an interesting choice you guys made. I don't know if it was in the script or it was something you decided on, but to have a little boy cleaning out his toys because he's, he's about to not be such a little boy anymore. Mm. And Instead of saying, hey, you know, buddy, we really got to talk about this or tell me how you're feeling. Don't cover it up. James, you could see him realize what was going on. And he just said, I'm here if you need me. Yeah. And it it was so nice, you know, met by a kid who's behaving in a and, in, in, you know, an emotional kind of salty way to be like, whenever you've done whatever you're doing, I'm here for you. Yeah. I was like, man, that's really nice parenting. Good parenting. And also how relatable. Like, oh, you're yeah. having big feelings, so you're busying yourself with a household activity. Yep. Mm. Yeah. We all do that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I stress clean. I sad clean. I big feeling uh -huh. clean all the time. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think that was something we decided to do. I, I wonder if I still have the script. I'd like to go look because yeah. I feel like there was a lot of just sitting in a room together, like Jamie's sitting on his bed and we come in and sit down next to him and have a talk. And I feel like that's what I do. I busy myself. If I don't want to deal with something, I just clean or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm, I'm being You've seen my spice look. cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm like, well, everything in here needs labeling. That's right. Uh, I have a question. Have we met Josh before? The lead actor? In, no, uh, Julian's no. Film. It felt odd that we didn't get, we were just supposed to get who this guy was. And he had been in a it. group setting on the set the episode before. Oh, he was there okay. in sort of the ca in the cast, like people standing around set. So we saw him, but it was very brief and probably not memorable enough for <laughs> no, the, it wasn't for the intro. <laughs> <laughs> what I loved was the choice that you guys made to shoot him coming in in slow motion, <laughs> handing things off, being handed other things. It was so clear, like, oh, this is the douchey yeah. young star guy. Well, that's why, because we didn't have any history with him. I was like, the audience is going to have yeah. no idea who this guy is if he just walks up to the craft service table. I need to, like, introduce him. People need to understand who he is and what his personality is ahead of time. Yeah. It was almost a way of seeing how he saw himself. Yes. Which was a yeah. great, like, okay, I think I know who you are. You know? like, <laughs> oh, we know you. Yeah, this didn't happen in real yeah. life, but this yeah. for sure happened in your head. Yeah, uh -huh. that was Paul uh -huh. Teal. And he played Noah in my version of The Notebook when we did the workshop of The Notebook in um, in Wilmington. He was our oh Noah and he was so good. And so he was already there and around a lot. And I think the Vin, Vin Cannons, when they knew they had this part coming up, they had seen him in my show and, and uh, called him into... To audition. Um, so it was really fun to see him actually on screen too. But he totally has mm -hmm. that, like, he kind of reminded me of Ryan Phillippe a little bit and had this, yep. like, real, mm -hmm. he just knew how to play douche, douche real well. <laughs> it worked for me. Was, was there ever, I, I just, I was shocked on our show when we had a legitimate opportunity to show more people in their underwear that we mm. didn't take it. Was there ever a scene of, of shooting the love scene in the movie? No. Because, like, mm. we shoehorn as much gratuitous uh, flesh mm, yeah. into the show as we can. And here we had a big sex scene being shot between Alex and Josh. And we You're right. didn't see it. And I thought, You're right. huh. And then That's it's like, but the episode went, okay, we made a mistake. Here's India Here's in lingerie. India. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Oof, that was a rough one. Yeah. Tell me about you having, because I, as I watched, I thought, I, I'm curious how Joy and India talked through this and, and did this. Mm -hmm. we, we had a big disagreement about this, actually, um, India and I. I. I love her, by the way. Like, I hang out with her mom when I go to London. India is amazing. <laughs> um, but that day, it was, you know, she... She was pretty new. She and I had worked together. I think we had one or two scenes together. And she, then she started working mostly with Grubs. Um, and 
I had envisioned her, I I was like, let's give her a real acting moment where she's she's been doing so much posturing as Miranda. And I want to give her this moment where she comes out and it turns out all of her posturing, she just has like normal granny panties and like a really uninteresting bra. And she comes out and she's just still super confident. And India was adamantly against this. And we kept kind of going back and forth between wardrobe, like, no, I really want, this is, uh, this really, I think will feel really great for the character. And then it would come back to me. India's really uncomfortable with that. She doesn't want to do it. And then I was like, okay, let me, it was going back and forth too much. I just went back, went over to her trailer and I was like, Hey, I let's, it's better if we talk face to face, what's going on. And, um, I don't know how much of what the women on set experience with our boss carried into India's journey as well. I haven't talked with her much about it, but she was so, uh, she was so nervous about the, the possibility of having to really come to set in a real set of underwear. And she was like, if I, if I could come to set in something that feels more like a costume, I can settle into this more. It still feels like it works for the character. And I just, please like woman to woman, this is what really feels more comfortable to me. Mm-hmm. And that was, that's it. You know, sometimes it just takes a face-to-face conversation. It was like, done, you got it. That's what we'll do. That's fine. And it worked. It worked great. Like she, she came out, she was boss. She looked amazing. Mm-hmm. She was, she committed to it. But why, why did we need India in her underwear in this episode? It's so unnecessary. And you're right, Rob, if it belonged anywhere, it would have been in a comedic setting of Alex and this Josh character yeah. trying to figure out their love scene. And instead yeah. we've got what like we've got Miranda walking around trying to prove vulnerability and I mean, it was just so awkward. Yeah. We even have a scene of of Julian referencing how the sex scene went. Exactly. And a funny yeah. thing happened. So it's like uh wait, what? You know what's really interesting about that is the Julian reference and like making it funny, I know is referential to something that happened on our set that really wasn't funny. And it yeah. really yeah. irked me. I was like, God, I hate that we're making jokes about this. And, yep. and watching, it's so interesting to hear that. I, di- I didn't, I do I didn't remember you and India's conversation in like the larger context. I, I wrote in my notes, I remembered how, uncomfortable she was yeah, and how nervous she yeah. was and what the pressure was and what was written into the script for her to be wearing. And, you know, how everyone was like, what do we do about the expectation from the boss and oh, yeah. whatever, whatever. And when I watched her walk out watching this episode, I was like, oh my God, I remembered her being like, the boss gets what's being demanded. And also if I'm wearing these black stockings, I'm almost wearing pants. Yes. And it feels like, like a Halloween costume. Less naked. Yes. Yeah. And what I loved seeing her do it now from this vantage point is I got to see it all in greater context. Cause obviously at the time we were all just like, God, this is so yeah, infuriating, terrible. And she plays so much of her stuff with grubs in this episode with like a very masculine swagger, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. even the way she grabs his beard and he thinks she's being cute and then she disses it mm-hmm. like all these things. And she's, I mean, she like clawed stomped mm-hmm. out there in that outfit <laughs> and was like, I'm hot. What do you want from me? And I was like, Oh my God, she really took this thing that made her uncomfortable and made it so boss. Powerful. And ironically walked out in lingerie, but managed to have so much of her body covered. Yep. And I was like, I want to give India a fucking high five yeah, today. So smart. Like, you guys crushed it. I'm so glad she had you as a director for that. She's so smart. Ugh, it was just great. Yeah. She saw something that I couldn't see. And when she explained it to me, it made total sense. Mm-hmm. And it yeah. just goes to show what a brilliant businesswoman she is too. Guys, if you aren't following yeah. India de Beaufort, you really should go follow her oh. on Instagram. Um, she's just really fun to watch anyway. And so, so a talented singer and um, stylist and like really interesting. I was going to say her styling videos. I know. I just sit and watch Anytime them. Anytime I have to go on a trip, I'm like, what should I wear? I need to go see what I could like wearing. pop a bag of popcorn <laughs> and just sit and watch those like one after another. Totally. <laughs> They're so fun. I need her to have a show. I know. Yeah, she's awesome. So that was, that went better than 
it would have if I had been on my own. So good, good on her. Yeah. You guys did such a good job. I'm so glad that for her in particular with that storyline, she had you as a director. Yeah, like it was so important for you to direct the, it, you know, Haley and Quinn and Taylor storyline with Lydia. Yeah. And I think it was also really important for you, you to be, you know, one of us directing one of yeah, us lucky. going through what we went through with our boss. Lucky. I think that was really thanks special. When she walks out and the hardcore rock and roll guitar riff came on, <laughs> I, just, I had, I just, I face palmed, yeah. like talk about hat on a hat, you know, it oh, was yeah. like, was I, I just laughed going, oh yeah, totally. Joy picked out the heavy duty guitar riff from when the girl, I like, Get out of here, man. You know what, though? In some ways, and that, that might have been Lindsay Wolfington additionally yeah. protecting India and making it even more campy. Yeah. Yes. Well, now that I hear what you're saying about she, it's like a costume she's wearing, you're 100% right. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it, it, it completely makes sense. But when it first happened in the moment, I was like, oh, as if we need to like highlight this ha- anymore. It's like, yeah. yeah. Okay, audience, here's what this is. <laughs> can can we also just address the red hair dye that was must have been in the water in Wilmington? Because first of all, uh-huh. so if you were the only one without this red in your hair, somehow you managed to get your hair like an ashy brown finally. But that's part of why we dyed my hair so dark because everyone's hair was running so red. Like even Millie. And at least for you guys. Yes, was at least for hair. you guys to play siblings, they were like, it works. But they started over dyeing my hair. I was bored. This was like, we're in Ariel, Little Mermaid territory. We're in like the, when you go to Emoji <laughs> yes. Mermaid on your phone, where it's like yeah. purple red, like this is the territory we're in for Haley. I don't really don't know what happened. Part of that is also though, the color timing. Because yeah. remember, they color timed our show so warm. Yeah. I mean, it changed the color of people's eyes. Yeah, yeah that's like true. They, they turned mm. the the warm saturation up so much on our show that I, I promise you, your hair was red, but it didn't look like Ariel in person. I promise. There were a couple of shots. I was like, did they just dump an entire bottle of henna <laughs> in my hair? And like, like iodine? Iodine. Uh, iodine. hundred percent. That's the color. Right? Before we uh, wrap up, I, I got to give a shout out to how funny the scene was with um, uh, wh- Brooke and Victoria when she's talking about how I've taken a lover. <laughs> yes. It's my honorable mention. All of that was great. Then Brooke and Julian, when, when Brooke tells Julian about it, and he's like, mm-hmm. why are you telling me this? And, and Brooke's like, because I had to endure it. So you have to uh-huh. endure yep. it. Yep. Yeah, we can be traumatized together. We can be traumatized <laughs> together is so good. And then are are we supposed to gather that uh, Paul stood up Victoria at the end? Is that why she's sitting at a table by herself frustrated? I guess so. That was a little vague too. I, I don't quite remember that. And I'm also assuming that, here's the question I had. So of course, when, when Julian's like, I'll walk you to your room. I'm like, dude. Can you, no, just one time, can you learn a lesson? Can you adapt, please? But, and then when Brooke walks in, obviously Alex is laying in bed naked. I think I know where the trick is, is that I'm guessing next episode, we're going to find out that he switched rooms with her because she wants her to get sleep. Exactly. All right, listeners, we have a, we have a listener question from Chelsea. Nathan mm-hmm. says to Lydia, you were responsible for raising the woman that changed my entire world. My mm-hmm. question is, wow, this is loaded. Who do you think had the most impact on your life? Wow. Thanks, Chelsea. That's a big That's a really question. Big one. I don't mm-hmm. think I could give that to one particular person. Like the best positive impact on your life? Yeah, there's so many... Ooh. There's like so many versions of that. And mm-hmm. I also would like to think because we're not all in our mid eighties, we don't know the final answer mm-hmm. to that question. Yeah, yet. that too. You know? Yeah. So many, there's so many different mentors, so many people. There's people I haven't even met that have made a huge impact on my life. There's people, I mean, our parents always make a huge impact. I don't know. I don't, mm-hmm. I honestly don't know if I have an answer for this. I don't, I don't have an MVP. Yeah, there's just too many. Listen, it genuinely took a village yeah. to, get, to yeah. get this guy where he is. So, yeah, man, team sport. 
Yeah, I like that. Team sport. <laughs> yeah. Let's spin a wheel, friends. Yeah. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. <gasps> <laughs> Most likely to plan their high school reunions. Not it. Absolutely, Hillary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For None sure. None of us. Definitely not any of the three of us, but her. She would yes, be the one. Yep. I buy that. How about a character on the show? Miss Lauren, probably, don't you think? And I was going to say, pre her struggle, Millie. Yeah. Yeah, Lauren and Millie really could have been great friends. I could see the two of them yeah. teaming up to plan a high school reunion. <laughs> For sure. I also love that we read the question and all three of us were like, not it. And then we thought about our characters and we were like, not it. Not Still it. Still not it. Still not it. <laughs> <laughs> I love us. Um, all right, cuties. Next week, we will be in season seven, episode 18, the last day of our acquaintance. I just remembered what the episode's about and I got so sad. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. Clay dyes his hair. <laughs> Wait, we didn't talk about Clay and Katie. Hold on. Two seconds. Oh. We got to spend oh. like, g- give me 90 seconds on Clay and Katie. Okay. This is crazy. Did you know this was coming? I mean, when you read the script, were you like, what are we doing? Come on. 100%. I remember reading this and going, oh, I wonder who they're going to get. Like, that's a tricky cast. Like, a cast. <laughs> like, I wonder who they're going to get. And they're like, good news. We got Amanda Shul. <laughs> like... <laughs> For the same, we're going to just soap opera this. And I just, they were like, don't worry, we have a fix. And apparently the fix was dyeing her hair like two shades different. You're like, yeah, but what about her same face? (laughs) Yeah, it's funny because that last shot of Clay when it's just that look of like, what? I think was just me in real life going, wait, what? What? (laughs) Also... He walks up to her while she, this is my mistake, obviously, as a director, but you walk up to her while she's playing tennis. Like, excuse me, in the middle of a tennis match, like she's <laughs> hitting balls and turns around. Like. <laughs> Maybe Clay is just in such shock that he loses all sort of like decorum. Total propriety. Yeah. It's the beginning of the fugue state. Oh, yes. gosh. I'm dreading. Okay, it's gonna Here be great. Go. It's all gonna be great, gang. Wild ride. <laughs> but yes, this was a this was an interesting turn of events. That I'm sure nothing crazy will come of it. You know? No. no, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> okay, folks. Cue the we'll Benny Hill soon. music. I'm obsessed. Thanks for joining us, gang. Thanks, Hi. y'all. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a review. You can also follow us on Instagram at dramaqueensoth. Or email us at dramaqueens at iheartradio.com. See you next time. We're all about that high school drama girl, drama girl, all about them high school queens. We'll take you for a ride in our comic girl, drama girl. cheering for the right team. Drama queens, drama queens, my girl, rough girl, fashion but you're tough girl, you could sit with us girl. Drama queens, drama queens, drama queens, drama, drama queens, drama queens.